Coming up on MuggleCast, we'll review the Secrets of Dumbledore scriptbook and then read your wonderful emails. And we also have some fun announcements to share. But first, a word from this week's sponsor, Indeed. Most people think that finding great talent is harder than mastering the Gelomancy. But with Indeed, it's as easy as a simple levitation spell. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed will be a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Find great talent faster through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. The assessments feature is a tool that helps star applicants shine because it asks them to take a test in advance. There are all kinds of subjects available, from cooking to coding. Indeed assessments help you take the stress out of the interview process. Your candidates get to prove themselves before the interview, and you can spend more time talking about what's important to you during the interview. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash MuggleCast. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash MuggleCast. Indeed.com slash MuggleCast. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. We are going to talk about the screenplay this week. We are going to also read some emails that we've received over the last few weeks. But first, we have a few exciting announcements. That's right. First of all is the return of Quizich Live, everybody's favorite online trivia game run by us. This is actually our 10th Quizich Live that we're going to be doing. I just counted. Ooh. We're celebrating, of course, our 17th birthday, which is next week. So Quizich Live happens Saturday, August 6th at 11 a.m. Eastern. And if you haven't played it yet, it's uh, the online trivia game. You'll be competing against fellow Harry Potter fans and MuggleCast listeners in real time. You will be able to watch us host the game via a live video stream, but you'll play the game itself on a mobile app or another tab or window. Uh, we do recommend you use a computer, um, but YouTube may help you out. There will be intricate instructions on how to join and how to play along on all of our socials, as well as the link. And most exciting is that we are going to be giving away some MuggleCast specific prizes. Yeah. So just to be clear, this is all MuggleCast trivia. It's yes. trivia about us for our birthday. It's kind of a birthday party, if you will. Andrew, give the audience a teaser. What is your favorite color? <laughs> <laughs> that's an answer to one of my security questions around the oh, internet so oh, i will oh. not share that uh, in that case i'll disregard the one i put down for your mother's maiden name <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway <laughs> it's gonna be a really exciting time you know we've done nine of these uh as i've just stated and uh it makes sense to celebrate in our uh, big way that we turn the questions inward to ourselves plus we've had listeners listening to us from throughout the years and so I'm excited to tell them to go back and re-listen to the whole catalog before next week. <laughs> <laughs> you have one week. Yeah. And if you can't join us live, that's okay. We will also be releasing this as an episode of MuggleCast. So once again, that's uh, next Saturday, August 6th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The stream starts at 11. The game's going to begin about 15 minutes later. And uh, all the links will be provided on our social media. Speaking of our birthday, we're going to be celebrating all week long on social media, so definitely keep an eye out. And as part of that, we're going to be hosting an Instagram Live uh, to talk about our favorite MuggleCast memories. That's going to be Wednesday, August 3rd at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be available to watch after the event, too, and obviously folks can watch over on instagram.com slash mugglecast or just at mugglecast that'll be fun wow we're doing so much for our birthday look at us <laughs> we are busy bees we are and last but not least don't forget we just announced this year's gifts for our patrons you can join the mugglecast collectors club and or receive the first and last ever mugglecast wand depending on your pledge level visit patreon.com slash mugglecast and pledge today you have until august 7th our 17th birthday to pledge or upgrade your existing pledge to receive your gift you must also remain pledged for three months in order to 
get your gift. The MuggleCast Collectors Club comes with five brand new vinyl MuggleCast inspired stickers every year, as well as a beautiful backing club card to collect them all on. This thing is seriously so gorgeous. And the first round of stickers are also really fun and beautiful. Um, looking forward to y'all getting them and starting to share them on our socials. We're going to be sending you four to five new stickers every year for the next few years. And the MuggleCast wand is an 11 inch handmade wooden wand by our friends at Heartwood Wands. We came up with a few brand new spells, which you'll receive with your wand upon delivery as well. So keep an eye out for those. Again, head on over to patreon.com slash mugglecast to make that pledge or increase that pledge. Your support goes to running this show and inspires us to do the show every week. Thanks, everybody. And now let's move on to the meats and potatoes of today's podcast. We are going to look at the Secrets of Dumbledore complete screenplay book. Now, hold on. I need to get to the opening credits again because this still makes me chuckle. Screenplay by J.K. Rowling and Steve Clovez based upon a screenplay by J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling delivered a screenplay. Warner Brothers said, (laughs) and they caught in Steve Clovez and (laughs) rewrote it. So where is that screenplay? The first screenplay, I wonder. Will that be published in a book? Mm. I will pay for that. I want to see how different the original screenplay was. Is there going to be like a bot campaign on Twitter to release the rolling cut? Ooh, <laughs> we need to start that immediately. Uh, do <laughs> nice we? reference to the most recent episode of Millennial. Yes. <laughs> but uh, two things come to mind about this Secrets of Dumbledore. Now, this is, of course, uh, a way different cover than the previous two screenplays. And uh, much to my dismay, I'll, I'll go ahead and say, they've decided to use the more popular poster with Fox uh, flying to Hogwarts rather than this uh, wonderful, ornate Art Deco cover that the previous two screenplays had by Mina Lima. It was really upsetting to readers and completionists. We like to put these books on our shelves, put them right next to each other. And when you jump from two Mina Lima covers to this which is a very generic Harry Potter poster. Nothing about this other than the title implies that this is for the Secrets of Dumbledore movie. It's Hogwarts and it's a phoenix. It's just so generic. It's marketing, though. Yeah. It is marketing. That's also the marketing for the whole movie. Hogwarts sells, baby. (laughs) What did it? What are the sales numbers like for this book? I Look how big Dumbledore is, too. Yeah, right. And how small Fantastic Beasts is. We uh, noted that, I think, when the first trailer came out for this movie. Anyway, we've read the screenplay. This one, actually, here's another way it's different. And this is a this is a good thing. There's concept art inside the script book. There are little interviews with Eddie Redmayne and David Yates and David Heyman. And then I believe costume designer, production designer. So there are or visual effects supervisor, not production designer. So... There is some extra elements in the script book compared to the other two. That is nice. When we were reading this, we were looking out for things that may have been different from the movie, uh, things that add to the movie. So hopefully we can enlighten people and give them a little extra context about the movie today. The first little bit of knowledge is uh, I've always been wondering since this film came out whether Dumbledore is actually sitting down with Grindelwald for tea. And it turns out based on page seven in the screenplay, Dumbledore, when he finds himself back at Hogwarts, it says, we find Dumbledore standing at his window, eyes closed. As we slowly pull focus on him, his eyes open, and we are back in the present. So that wording really makes me think that it was more of a flashback that Dumbledore and Grindelwald were out having tea and Grindelwald made a very racist comment. Yeah, And yet there's really no other indication that time has passed or how far back that was set because they look exactly the same. It could have been a week ago. It could have been five years ago. We just don't know. Well, and Mads Mikkelsen is Grindelwald. (laughs) Right. If it were that much of a flashback, they should have had Johnny Depp do that. Right. Right. So maybe it wasn't that far back. (laughs) Also, why the flames? Why the flames? Why is he getting on the train? But then is that like suddenly back somewhere else? I don't know. Is it possible, though, that for the purposes of the final film, it's not a flashback. Although the way it's written here, it is one and they made that change. Because as we learn later, we also have a mirror world that exists. So anything is possible. Maybe it's just up to your imagination how this all plays out. Yeah, it's not consistent, but it's always interesting in seeing what the screenwriters 
say about it, because that's, I guess, the closest literal interpretation of what we're going to be looking for, such as this next point, exterior Tianzi Mountains. Uh, this is where Newt finds the chillin'. I googled this. The Tianzi Mountains are in South Central China. So if this film had done location markers and let the audience know where things were happening, it would say Tianzi Mountains, China. That's where Newt finds the chillin'. That's where the chillin' is attacked. And the second one is born. And that's pretty cool because, you know, Newt is getting some globe trotting in. Mystery solved. Yes. It does still raise the question for me why they left location markers out of the film at all. Just because it, it would be one thing if they stopped moving to multiple locations, right? It would be one thing if this wasn't a globe trotting movie. So they decided to drop that. But they went so many different places in the film. I think it actually would have been helpful. I think so, too. I think the second film does it, too. I mean, to, mm -hmm. it, they actually do them. Yeah. And it makes sense. This this film might even go two more places. So it's just kind of one of those things. Why did they make that choice? The first one definitely does it. And we're only in New York. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't there one for like magical headquarters of the United States? It's yeah. like Makuza. All right, Micah, what else did we find here? So one of the big differences that I had found, if you go to page 35, 36 of the screenplay is it appears that the Dumbledore blood pact scene was slightly more intense initially than what uh, they ended up releasing in the film. Particularly, there's this moment where his eyes roll back into his head. And, and this scene is when he's with Newt and Theseus and he is explaining what would happen if he were to try and move against Grindelwald, how the blood pact would in fact I guess, damage him, kill him, hurt mm. him. But yeah, this was, to me, at least in reading it, I didn't go back and watch this exact scene, but- I did. Do his eyes roll into the back of his head? No, I can confirm. I did not see that. That said, there are many shots during that little sequence, and perhaps they did shoot something like that, where Jude Law is rolling his eyes into the back of his head, and then it just hit the cutting room floor. I was hoping with this screenplay, we would get more of a description as to why the Blood Pact was trying to what looked like run away from Albus. It doesn't really offer it. It doesn't offer that. So I was a little bummed about that. Yeah, sometimes you will get in like italics some kind of character or observation from the screenwriter about what somebody is feeling, but not in that case. Yeah, or like the Blood Pact moves away from Albus because... <laughs> <laughs> because why? Because, because. Tell us your secrets, Dumbledore. Also, no explanation about why the Blood Pact was uh, performing property damage to the set of the no. film by carving into the wall. Maybe they thought they'd get a, a head start on tearing down the set for the movie when they were done filming. But like, can we just have it attack <laughs> the wall? Can we just have that happen? It's also called a blood trough in the book, right? Yeah. Yes. I wondered what it was that Theseus was saying because... No subtitles. I'm just honestly kind of surprised that based on the blood pack trying to stop Albus from even thinking about moving against Grindelwald, that it wouldn't attack him. Yeah. I mean, well, it does wrap around his wrist and the script book is actually very violent. It says like pulsing well, right, veins. Yeah. I guess it is attacking him if he's like in clear pain. Yeah. It is physically attacking him and yet it's also running away from him. It's very <laughs> strange. I'm surprised it didn't pull an umbrage and start mm. carving on the back of the hand. I must not betray the trough. <laughs> <laughs> True. That would just been another moment to tie back to the Harry Potter series that they copied if yeah. it started. I must <laughs> not tell that. lies. <laughs> well, there was also this little moment, which uh, I had the same experience as Jacob getting off the subway on Thursday. Uh, apparently, <laughs> there was a cockroach in his bakery. Now, I feel like that's something that would have stood out I went back to look for this. I didn't see it. It could have been one of those things, blink and you miss it. But mm. I'm glad that Jacob doesn't have cockroach problems. He's got too many other things to worry about. I just looked up when Raid was invented. and It was invented in 1956. So we're uh, two decades and it's a major urban area in the 1920s. I'm sure, you know, they were hard to get rid of. That's a health code violation, though. It does say that he, uh, yeah, he's, he's handling an, uh, a tray of cookies or something and he brushes off a cockroach. Ew. Yeah, I just walked the other direction. 
when I got out of the subway. <laughs> yeah, that that's the appropriate response. Because you never know what they're going to do. I mean, they're pretty vicious. <laughs> I think it's probably meant as a, an indicator of Jacob personally, right? So he's yeah. not in the best shape. He's not taking care of himself because he's sad. He's lonely. And he's not taking care of the bakery because of that. Right. He forgot to lay down new roach traps. I mean, we would have at least been able to add another fantastic beast to the count, but I guess we can't do that now. If it were a magical beast sent to spy on Jacob for Dumbledore. One other mention that is actually in the movie, I did go back and check on this, is Jacob mentioned seeing a therapist. And I think that's also a blink and you'll miss it type of moment. It's when he's talking to uh, Lolly about just the fact that he's trying to forget his time uh, in the wizarding world and that they've caused him enough trouble. He doesn't want to be bothered with them anymore. I find this one of those things too, where unless you're watching the movie with subtitles or you have a you know, screenplay to be able to go back to, you're going to miss it, especially, and I know we've talked about this on previous episodes, sometimes just how low the audio is. And because of the accent sometimes, I guess Jacob would be more of a New York accent, but it's just... It's hard to understand what's going on. That sequence is also just moving very fast. And I too, Micah, I read this line in the script book. I couldn't believe that this was in the movie. So I went back and watched this as well. And it was there and I was equally surprised. So yeah, I I think it's just sometimes there's so much happening in a movie. You're not really processing every little moment that's happening. But I'm glad I wasn't alone and completely missing this line. It's just a, it's a different experience when you read. Yeah, it is. And it seems like a very different um, kind of a more modern take on the character that he'd go see a therapist. But I'm thrilled that uh, 1920s Jacob Kowalski was, uh, you know, so inclined as to seek better mental health. Yeah. Must not do better help ad now. Must wait. Must oh, wait. It would have been perfect. <laughs> it you can do it, perfect. Andrew. You can do it. Don't be like the blood trough. <laughs> Resist. I think it shows also that Jacob is just a man ahead of his time. And I think we see other indications of that during the series. I think it's why he's a fan favorite, right? He is so yeah. open-minded about learning about people and things that he didn't know existed previously, which we see in movie one that not everybody is that progressive. So that's right. Good on Jacob. You know what else I thought of? This is back going back to the cockroach real quickly. That could be a wonderful foreshadowing to the cockroach clusters that the Slytherins give Jacob later. Oh, maybe there was something. Maybe there was like a setup and a payoff and we missed it. (laughs) Cute little connection there. Perhaps. Yeah. yeah, He ends up eating that very cockroach. (laughs) So one of the other things I wanted to bring up on page 66, uh, there's a rendering of Professor Hicks's advanced charm casting book. And this is actually on the opposite page of Newt's book. And this, of course, comes up when they're on the train and they're talking about all the published works that um, they're each responsible for. So I wondered, is this a future publication for Bloomsbury for Scholastic? The fact that they actually took the time, Mina Lima, I'm presuming, to draw this book cover. Could be. Uh, Maybe in a year or two, we'll see a journal that has that cover. Like a lined notebook. That's one thing I did really like about this book, though. I know we weren't too hot on the cover, but the renderings that are in the book do give a lot of detailed information that you wouldn't be able to catch just watching the film. Yes. Well, especially the uh, the prints of art uh, for either unfinished, the either they didn't make it into the film, first drafts of art. All of this stuff is stunningly detailed. I'm thinking, too, there's a ticket for the train that they're on in Berlin that's presented in the script book. And I'm just like, no one would ever, ever see that. Even if even if one of the main characters had their tickets sitting out, you'd never be able to tell what's on it. And uh, German currency. There's a, uh, an example of both sides of the coin that the German wizards use. You'd never be able to see it. So stuff like that is actually very interesting. And it's interesting also that it's appearing in the screenplay versus like a art of you know, Secrets of Dumbledore, big compendium. There's also a good bit of information about the train as well. And they kind of compare it to the Hogwarts Express and say how, well, muggles can't see the Hogwarts Express at all. This train is actually a muggle train, but has kind of a end car that is specifically for witches and wizards to take. And I thought that was kind of cool. Micah, I'm so excited for you. This next one, this was big news for you. (laughs) Huge. 
page 98, there is a goat in the hog's head rendering. He's kind of tucked in the back a little bit. He's outside. So I guess that's why we didn't see him <laughs> or her. This game was for a walk, out for a walk. But I, I like the fact that uh, they did end up including a goat for Aberforth. Whoever designed it is a real one, a real Harry Potter they fan. Are. Good on you, concept designer, <laughs> concept artist. Now, speaking of animals, page 105. All right. Apparently, phoenixes eat crusts of bread. <laughs> oh, good. I have all these crusts of bread sitting here that I have been looking to get rid of. I just need a pet phoenix to help me with those. I, like, really? It's not a pigeon. No wonder it's dying. <laughs> it's not a duck. It's dying. You're feeding it bread. That's why it's dying. Bread is actually very bad for birds. <laughs> right. Despite what we all think. But uh, I always wondered what Phoenix, what, what Fox and Credence were doing, where it's like dive bombing him and he's like holding something out. He's apparently just feeding it. I don't think phoenixes need to eat anything honestly they're immortal birds so <laughs> that's what i always assumed i always assumed they didn't need to eat anything so this just feels like a very random inclusion all right so who did this was it rolling or was it clovis or did they both say i know bread let's check our context clue. maybe this was the one part of the movie they both agreed on like, <laughs> yes, we need a fe feeding the phoenix scene. Joe, we saw your original script and uh, wow, it was really bad. But that bread line, woo, <laughs> we're saving that. Are we then to presume that that scene is then Credence just like he threw pieces of bread into the air and that's what the phoenix was doing as it swooped down past him? I guess. Yeah, the glowing phoenix sweeps through the air to catch a crust of bread. Credence stands below. Credence is like that guy in the park sitting on the bench, just like throwing right. bread crust at the pigeons. Right. <laughs> He's that guy, that old man. <laughs> this is where it lost me totally. <laughs> <laughs> That's out. okay. I found a few more things that are interesting. On page 123 of the script book, this is after uh, Yusuf has arrived with Grindelwald. And after the memory of Lita is presumably erased, we did not get any answers as far as if there's a backup of the memory or any kind of hope there that Kama's going to remember his sister in movies of future. But this line, Queenie watches Grindelwald begin to escort Kama inside when just as he passes, Kama's vacant eyes meet her, briefly glimmer with intensity as if he were sending her a message. As he vanishes inside, dot, 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 would be nice to know what that message is. The message right. is, I am on your sister's side still, I think. Mm. So, you know, I'm still on Newt's side. I'm still on the good side. That would be what I take away from this. This is also- well, What is Kama sending to Queenie? Right. It's also just an example of something that obviously works better in a written format, <laughs> Um, I mm. don't see how we were supposed to very clearly interpret this just based on watching the movie. I think it's the look at each other is like, I'm still on the good side. Mm. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's Kama has no choice but to look at people significantly because they haven't really given him many lines in this film. Right. And it, it's also pointed out, I think, that Rosier kind of picks up on it. Mm. Because there's that exchange between her and Queenie before they go inside as well. Uh, but there are a couple moments like this throughout the screenplay where you get that confirmation. I think there's also one with Queenie kind of help. We all kind of assume she was helping out Jacob at the uh, dinner party. Yes. And that was made clear in this book as well. Yeah. Eric. Yes. Well, I got a couple coming up for you, but Mirror World officially confirmed 100%. They were in another dimension. They were in another dimension inside the Deluminator, everybody. That is, I think I'm two for two on that. Uh, I'll forgive the Grindelwald confusion. Yeah, visual effects person Christian Manns in a quote inside the script book says, usually if we smash up a city, we then have to fix it. But here Dumbledore and Credence are in a mirror world. And in the end, we're in this world that's gone completely black, but the melted puddles all over the ground uh, inside them, you can see daylight and traffic in the real Berlin going on just as it was. And the script book also says, Dumbledore lifts the deluminator. With a flick, the street around them is sucked into it, melting like a painting, leaving the negative image of the real world as if it were a distant 
memory. Okay. Yeah, I do like this. I think it's a safe way to have a action sequence like this without worrying about what all the muggles are thinking or keeping them out of harm's way. So I think this is a cool way of doing it. Yeah, I think so too. And I mean, visually, this whole sequence was really stunning because to the point referenced here in the description, if you looked very closely, you could see the visuals of the normal Muggle streets still playing out around them. They were just not actually in it. So it is it is really beautiful um, visually. And I think a great idea that kind of differentiates the way that fight scenes in the Muggle world have been depicted previously in Wizarding World mm. films. So that's cool. I just wish that we had more, still more information about why this exists, how it came into being. We have to also remember Dumbledore gives Ron the Deluminator. And right? there's no reference to any of this in the core. Well, Potter that books. little beam of right. Doesn't the little beam of light that enters Ron that goes into him is kind of like the bead Dumbledore's bead right. that he shoots through the mirror kind of vaguely enough. We thought it was spit, but it's actually that bead. <laughs> it's not spittle. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's actually ash. I think it's Phoenix ash. It says in the script book and it turns into water. Dumbledore like transfigures it non-verbally. I thought there was a reference to a snowflake. Like it was a snowflake, then a bead of water. Oh, a snowflake. Okay. So Dumbledore is so hot that he melts it back into water. Um, <laughs> but uh, the Deluminator backstory now. So it's just been given a, a whole nother facet of what it can do, which makes the the speculation inside the book that it's a um, device of Dumbledore's own making uh, even grander. Because if it can do this, damn, what can it do? Dumbledore slowly blows on a snowflake and it transforms into a water droplet. There wasn't too much more extra info there as well. I was hoping for that as well. Yeah. And like, I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole, but it also just creates questions for me. Like, why didn't Dumbledore hide Lily and James in this mirror world? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe Voldemort would know how to penetrate that. A mirror world is no place to raise a child, Laura. It's true. It's true. So we should send Harry to the Dursleys instead. That's yeah. a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> that is a pretty good plot hole, actually. I mean, I'm just having fun here. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric, another vindication for you on page 143, talking about those renderings again uh, on Grindelwald's poster, you actually see the words supreme mugwump not once uttered in the course of the film but it's there <laughs> on the poster you guys i am absolutely thrilled this is maybe my number one cause that i have fought for that feels like it's gotten paid off take this to my grave put it on my tombstone was right about supreme <laughs> mugwump whoever designed that poster also designed that concept art with the goat in it that's a real one right there yeah is that mina lima though likely for the for the poster at least, right? I think for the Grindelwald poster, Probably. yeah. Probably. Yeah, there's also one where it says it says it on Lou Dow's as well, Supreme Mugwump. So it's definitely what they were going for, but the position somehow never gets mentioned by name. Beautiful. I love it. I'm having a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Eric's not returning the script book when, the, yeah, uh, yeah, when we're yeah, done yeah. with this I'm episode. Gonna, gonna... I might be, but Eric's framing that page. Mike is framing that other page with the goat in the concept art. <laughs> So speaking about, I, I said there were no location markers. I also wanted clarification on what on whether the tiny little lobster creatures were the same as the large creature at the bottom of the pit in the Urkstag. Did you guys think that maybe they could be different creatures? Because I did. They seemed like different creatures. They did. Like if each one of these little guys grows up to become that big guy, there's a huge infestation problem. Um, that said, the script book does confirm they are both manticores. So the little ones are uh, described in the script book as baby manticore. And the one at the bottom of the pit is the giant manticore. So Newt does not say this. I would think that he'd tell Theseus at some point, like, oh, don't worry, they're just manticores. Uh, except they're only a problem if they grow over 100 feet, uh, something like that. But it doesn't happen. So it's nice to get that confirmation yeah. all the same. It's, it's interesting. I always assumed they were 
the same thing. And I thought it was akin to like how if you think about insect colonies, like an ant colony, for example, or a bee colony, Uh, the queen is always larger than everything else. And mm -hmm. I don't know scientifically why this happens, but, um, you know, the worker ants or the worker bees never grow to match the size of the queen. So I wonder if that's what's at play here. Yeah, that makes sense. I I always thought it was within the realm of possibility that they were the same creature, but logistically it doesn't make sense because if you can picture those babies all growing up, well, then again, I guess what you said about the queen is true. So they never will grow to that size. That's a good point. Maybe there's like a high uh, mortality rate. (laughs) Maybe most of them die before they reach that maturity. I know that's a really dark way to look at it, but it, it seems in scope for how things yeah. are explained in the wizarding world. While we're on this subject of the uh, the manticores, it's actually confirmed via another tidbit by Christian Mann's visual effects guy that the whole Urksag is lit by these lanterns that each contain a glow fly. And the story is that the manticore really doesn't like those bugs. So they're hung outside everybody's cell. When a lantern goes out, the manticore attacks. So as soon as you see your bug die, you know you're dead because the manticore will come and skewer you. This we obviously see in the film as Newton Theseus is escaping. My question then is, why is this uh, the, how things are down here in the Erkstag? Because those glow flies seem to only go for like a short period of time. Uh, Newt's only Newt's only lasts like 30 minutes tops. So if this is a prison where you're meant to imprison people and keep them here, maybe for further questioning, why is there this really very precarious uh, method by which your prisoner might die before you can use them for like Newt's brother is the head of the uh, British R office and they're going to put him down somewhere where his light could go out and he could be just digested. Like, that's not an effective form. It doesn't, well, it genuinely does not make any sense, actually, uh, in terms of what the movie was supposed to do. And I definitely want other folks to weigh in here. It reminded me a bit of a precursor to a concentration camp, the way that everything was set up here. And I don't think that anybody who was going in there, the plan was not for them to come out. Right. right. And right. As the guy running the place heavily implied. Exactly. But then why are there visitation papers? Like why why even bother setting up a whole line of paperwork to go visit people if they really only have hours to live anyway? It's a great question. Well, the guy running the place probably gets some sick pleasure out of it. <laughs> why why <laughs> it let just, people down there anyway? Well, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, the, the, any way you slice it, Theseus would be I don't say a prisoner of war, but like a, an enemy combatant, or he would have knowledge that would be valuable to the corrupt German ministry officials, especially for how central he is to Dumbledore. He was just hanging out in Dumbledore's brother's place the day before last. There's no way they would sentence him to like basically a death sentence uh, within 30 minutes of him being captured. Yeah. And I think that's an example of something um, I think qualifies as a plot hole. I think when you find yourself having to come up with justifications to explain why they might have been doing something, it's a little bit of bad writing. Yeah. But I agree with Micah's overall point. This was definitely meant to thematically represent an early version of a concentration camp because we know that the intention there was not for people to come out either. And this movie draws, you know, heavily from the themes of World War II. So it makes sense. So this next point is for you guys, kind of. Remember how we were all guessing how many house elves were going to be in the film? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, the script book, when, Dum- uh, when Grindelwald breaks in uh, to the very fancy dinner and the music stops playing and then Grindelwald turns around uh, and looks at the house elf quartet. It's listed as in this script yeah. book. This jumped out to me too. I was like, wait, doesn't this imply there should be four house elves? But there was that one budget conducting four instruments, I guess. Yeah. The filmmakers had two ways in which they could bring this from the script back to life. The first was to animate four house elves playing string instruments. And the second was to just do one because of budgets. So they went the one route 
but I think originally there could have been four for sure. It's a budget pacing issue. Well, I would say budget cut, but you still have animated instruments. I guess that would be cheaper than also adding the house elves. Is all those mana cores. Maybe they just forgot to go back and add in the house, <laughs> the elves. house elves. I mean, we have that messed up line from Laley, right? The year has passed when it's oh, actually yeah, yeah, been yeah. more. There's some things that totally get away from them, yeah. So this I found interesting. We've been speaking about some concept art on page 148. Actually, that's not right. Oh, this is so weird. This page does say 148, but it's not page 148. Oh, my God, you're right. (laughs) This must be a page from The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore. Preliminary graphic for Dumbledore Family Tree. And it says page 148, but it's not page 148. This is a page from another book. That's so funny. Would it have been that hard to edit that out? So on page 186, though, on the page itself, it says page 148 in the same spot as all the other page numbers are in the rest of the book. There's a small Dumbledore family tree, and it notes in very small print that a fist fight broke out between Albus and Aberforth at Ariana's funeral. Now, I did a quick Google to see if this is brand new information or not. This is actually noted in The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore chapter of Deathly Hallows, I'm presuming from Rita's book. But then it's also funny that they maybe just copy and pasted something from Rita's book and put it into this script book for a movie that's set in the early 1930s. Oh, right. But, you know, the font is so small, nobody's actually, you know, going to pay attention to it. They just needed some text to fill the design. It's interesting that 148, because if you look at all the other renderings, all the other drawings, they don't have page numbers on them at all. None of them do in the entire book. So, Uh, Listeners, send in your conspiracy theories. What can 148 (laughs) be? uh, This will actually be the final question next week's Quizich Live. Uh, What does 148 reference? 148 gate. So it must be from another book. Yeah. This is art from another book, but what book would it be? It's got to be Rita's book. I think that's right. But then why is it in this? Uh. Well, and opposite that page is the Dumbledore family crest. And the Dumbledore family crest is actually uh, lightly behind the Dumbledore family tree. Maybe this is a page in like an official government archive or something. Or It's possible, though. You know, we know that Mina Lima designed all kinds of things. So perhaps yeah. they designed this page from back when they were doing the harry potter movies and they just included it yeah yeah this could be from some kind of official like bible that they're keeping back in some cupboard somewhere yeah maybe this is from the encyclopedia (laughs) (laughs) encyclopedia confirmed so continuing on with the uh the drawings on page 175 what i found interesting about this is uh who is mentioned in it. So there is a drawing of Transfiguration Today, which looks like it's a magazine. uh, And it in fact says, the magazine that changes lives, Albus Dumbledore presents theory and practice in 20th century transfiguration. So I agree with the question you have here, Eric. What does this man do? What is his job? Because we were told he taught transfiguration. Then for the purposes of these films, he teaches defense against the dark arts. But according to this, he teaches transfiguration. I'm lost. Well, he is an expert in transfiguration. It's almost as if in this film, he's back being the transfiguration teacher. And at some point, I caught this earlier when McGonagall's knocking on the door at the Hogshead, uh, Dumbledore asks Minerva if she can cover his classes. Yeah. And now, granted, I think that Minerva would be a great stand-in DADA teacher as well, but between that and this Transfiguration Today cover, I'm like, oh, he's he's actually back being the Transfiguration teacher. But if that's Good the case, catch. what is Minerva's job? <laughs> because she doesn't need to exist. We know she wasn't supposed to be born yet, technically, if Hogwarts has a Transfiguration teacher. The timeline for McGonagall's character in these films really starts to unravel when you look at questions like this. So it could be anything, honestly. It could be anything. Like, Yeah, in this version of the stories, she was born like 30 years earlier or whatever. And she also, you know, teaches charms or potions or whatever. But she has a passing interest in transfiguration, which is why she subs for Dumbledore. Yeah. And just for reference, like this was brought up 
right around the time they're all in the great hall and, and Dumbledore does the uh, Bhutan mural in midair. But I don't think we actually ever see a copy of this at all. So it's interesting that they decided to include it in the screenplay. One thing I wanted to mention, final little note here, page 214, there's a wanted poster for Jacob, and it was kind of fun to read. It says, have you seen this muggle wanted for the attempted murder of a wizard in possession of a counterfeit wand? This mindless muggle is extremely dangerous and vicious. It kind of reminds me of the Sirius Black poster (laughs) and all the uh, hoopla around Sirius Black being on the loose. But mindless muggle. I did. I didn't. I don't think I caught that in the movie itself. So it was fun to see that poster. <laughs> yeah. It. Um. I mean, it basically is also this huge propaganda that uh, allows for the takeover of the Muggle world uh, that Gellert wants to wants to do by first casting your enemy, the Muggle, as mindless, as somebody that is just crazed and can't be reasoned with. You're othering them and making it easier for people to think that it's okay to just attack on site, that kind of a thing, because they will if you don't. There was uh, one other thing I wanted to bring up really quickly, and it was about uh, Grindelwald. And I think it's actually the only kind of note we get from Mads Mikkelsen in the book. And he says, I have a hunch that Grindelwald experienced something unforgivable or even extremely brutal at a very young age. And that was when his hatred of muggles began. So I thought that was kind of cool. I don't know if he has any insight there. Yeah, I I got the impression he was just speculating, but it wouldn't surprise me if he was attacked by muggles early on. There's a lot. There's a couple of things like that where the actors are just there for a paragraph talking about their characters. But I, I would say Mads is the most interesting of them all because of this tidbit. He does clarify that it is just his take on the character. Right. I think that's probably right. Like, did he see a muggle kill another muggle when he was a kid? And then he just like was so shocked by it and kind of enthralled that he was like, oh, muggles are bad, but I can still go on and do this. Two other things very quickly from the the screenplay. And maybe I missed this when we were talking casting early on, but a character called Zabini comes up uh, multiple Mm. times, uh, which I thought was a nice additional throwback to, uh, uh, the Potter series, and then calling, um, I guess, what would be Death Eaters, Dark Aurors. That was mm. mentioned so many times throughout this book. I don't ever remember them being referenced as Dark Aurors in the movie. No. Me Certainly either. not an official title. Yeah, so my final thoughts on the script book, I, I feel like with book one or two, we saw some deleted scenes or some alternate lines. There was none of that in the script book. We know they made some major changes. So this really follows the final cut of the movie to a T. It's nice to have a little bit of additional behind the scenes info, but I would have greatly preferred once again, that this be the actual shooting script, include the deleted scenes that they actually shot. That would make this more interesting. I don't really know the purpose of these script books still. Other than for us to talk about them for an hour and then, make <laughs> and then money. never again. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I we talked about it so that you don't have to buy it, you know, if you're listening. Right. And that's, yes. that's kind of our point in doing this, too, because so for something called the complete screenplay, you would expect to see something deleted or just the shooting script. But it's almost as if with all of these, it's felt to me as if they just went back and erased pages that weren't in the final film. And that's very disingenuous. Like with The Cursed Child, if your first encounter with this work is the script book, you're going to be left underwhelmed. You don't get all the fun and magic of the movie or the stage play. So in a way, like it kind of is bad for the movie. Just trying to make money however they can. We did hear from uh, Academy Award winner Colleen Atwood, though, uh, who describes Dumbledore as being in a lot of muted grays which are apparently a deliberate reference to the light violets that he would eventually wear. I had that same thought. I was like, really? Light gray goes Gr- to gray violet means, somehow? Gray <laughs> means light purple? Okay. She's, she called that out. She was like, we're transitioning, basically, to the Dumbledore you see in the later books with the brighter colors. I'm like, mm, mm. I don't know. <laughs> Pretty sure everything in this movie is gray, and it's been gray for eight films. Yeah. But okay. You're pivoting in the wrong direction. So are we going to get an explanation of how Dumbledore ages like 40 years in 11 years? Listen, we're all aging 40 years in in these 11 years. Fair enough. 
All right, we still have some emails to read today, but first, let's talk about therapy. Jacob goes to therapy. Maybe you should go to therapy, too. It's time for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Our brains need to be taken care of. It's just like every other part of the body. We need to give our brain time to rest. How we care for our minds affects how we experience life, so it's important to invest time and care into keeping our brains healthy. There are plenty of ways to support a healthy brain. You can turn off the screen and go for a walk. You can read a book, build some Legos, just lay outside and stare into space. Ah, Everyone's got their own ways to heal, and another way we always hear about is by going to therapy. And the nice thing about our sponsor, BetterHelp, is you don't have to go to therapy. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat-only therapy sessions. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Your therapist at BetterHelp is always available via your smartphone, and this saves you the hassle of having to go to a therapist's office. This convenience is the big reason I love BetterHelp. It's really great having a trustworthy counselor on your side to help steer you through life. Plus, it's easy to change counselors if you feel like you're not having the right chemistry with the first one you try. And this is actually a common part of getting started with therapy. Sometimes you have to move around to different therapists to find the right match. And luckily, BetterHelp makes it easy to change if you want to. Give this a try if you're thinking about therapy. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash MuggleCast. That's Better, H-E-L-P, dot com slash MuggleCast. You listening, Jacob? And now we have some emails from our listeners. This first one is from Stefan. What house did Madame Pomfrey belong to? My wife has recently gotten into Harry and crew and has also received her master's in nursing. She has a feverishly growing wand collection as a result of her being chosen at Ollivander's at Universal Studios on our honeymoon. I recently was able to get her a Madame Pomfrey wand for her birthday, not available at Universal, which proposed the question, what house did Poppy belong to? We cannot find this info in any of our research. Any info you might be able to supply us with towards this end would be greatly appreciated. So, Stefan, when we can't find info, when it doesn't exist, like Jacob's birthday, for example, we just invent it ourselves, and then we try to add it to the Harry Potter wiki. <laughs> Within reason. Within reason. I feel like I'd say either Ravenclaw or Hufflepuff. And I was thinking about examples from the book that we might use. You know how uh, offended she is every time somebody breaks the rules of how many people can be in the ward at any one time, but... Saying that, I couldn't think whether she was angry because of Ravenclaw reasons, uh, that it's the rules, or whether it was Hufflepuff reasons because people are not giving the uh, patient time enough to heal. Right. So I'm indecided, actually. It could be either or. Maybe she was a hat stall between Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff, and she ultimately had to pick one. Yeah, I'll go maybe. with Ravenclaw. I would, too. I was going to say Hufflepuff. Oh, and he's a Ravenclaw. Mike it as a one Pomfrey in his house. And what's your evidence? Just the caretaking nature of her. Oh, Aww. that's a good point. Also, we have to reserve Ravenclaw for the evil defense against the dark arts professors. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> at this point, at this point, I think it's suffice to say that uh, if uh, Pomfrey were at Ilvermorny, she would be a Pukwudgie, which is the healer house. Yeah. That's interesting that it's not. Anywhere. It is weird, right? A couple years from now, it's going to come out. It's going to be retconned that she was a Slytherin the whole time. <laughs> Everyone's going to be shook. All right. Next email. This one uh, is a question about James and Lily from Hermione12319. My theory as to whether James became a good person as he grew up, I believe he probably would have become a better person had he lived longer. Lily did not like him. Each of the Marauders were really good at magic. Perhaps he used a spell to change her mind and convince her to marry him. So wouldn't this have made Harry into a bad person? Because look what happened when Tom Riddle was born out of a love potion. Right. So also, this is very dark to think about. This is rough because not only would James have had to do this very horrible thing to Lily, but then the rest of the Marauders would have had to just consent to it, let him do it. And that speaks to a level of like toxic brohood that I don't even want to think about in my not in my Harry Potter series. Yeah, this was <laughs> one of those that came out of the uh, indefensible character episode that we had a couple weeks ago. 
you know, I'm willing to entertain almost any reading of these texts. Um, I'd just be curious to hear more about this theory and, you know, what um, areas of the text may support it. Um, because I think there are a lot of different readings that you can do of any literature. So that's my English major coming out on this. Well, I think it, I think it <laughs> comes from us not really having anything about James and it's not really sold well that they that Harry's parents loved each other. Yeah. So well, fair enough. Yeah. OK. I still go back to the fact that Harry turned out good. So James was good. That's right. my yeah. headcanon. All right. Our next email comes from Jane, who writes in about Filch's job. This feels very deliberate that I was given the Filch email. (laughs) Totally random, Laura, I assure you. Jane says, I was just listening to your most recent podcast, episode 568, and had a thought about Filch. It was mentioned that Filch being a squib, he would have been put at a disadvantage with his job due to lacking the ability to clean things magically. I just thought an interesting thing to add, though, is that the house elves are also working there as well, and they do have magical abilities. While, yes, Filch is at a disadvantage, he isn't responsible for cleaning the entire inside of the castle. It makes me wonder if Dumbledore gave him less of a cleaning responsibility due to this and allowed him to be more of a disciplined plenarian. Just a thought. Thanks for all you guys do. It's an interesting thought because it still kind of puts Filch at a disadvantage to be a disciplinarian because he's disciplining people who can do magic, which he can't do. Yeah. And is there a strategic reason why Filch would be at Hogwarts? We know that Dumbledore only employs people who have like very special use to him, but that's not clear. I love that it was pointed out that the house elves also clean because Goblet of Fire is the book that I have reread the least. So when I am reminded that the house elves are actually cleaning the common rooms, you would never, ever see Filch in somebody's common room sweeping up. It's the house elves. And so when Hermione starts leaving out clothing for the uh, house elves, the rest of the Gryffindors are like, hey, can you stop? My laundry needs doing. Uh, Please stop. So Yeah. This is another thing that is really irksome about the way house elves are introduced and treated in these books, because they have magical abilities, and yet they're physically cooking food in the kitchens, they're physically cleaning. So it it feels like an extra added layer of cruelty to be like, you're slaves and you have magic, but you can't use it. You have to do all of this stuff manually. Well, do we know that they're cooking food manually or cleaning manually? Couldn't they just... What would be the point of Hogwarts having kitchens if they weren't... You still need a place to, like, prep, right? Like... That's cooking. Well, I'm not suggesting somebody's manually lighting the burner to the stove, right? (laughs) Like, they can make that happen. Incendio. Yeah. Yeah. If they're just sort of manifesting food from nowhere then why do they need a whole dedicated space to do it prep you ever get a plate and the food (laughs) is aligned in just the right way you're like this is gorgeous i need to instagram this right that's what their job is they're artists they're manually putting together the charcuterie boards and sending them upstairs that's my theory but it is a great question and uh always good to get that uh reminder from jane yeah I tried doing some research on Filch and there really is not a whole lot of information. And I think going back to what you were saying earlier, begs the question, why is he even at Hogwarts to begin with? He doesn't like students at all. So is it just the hope that by being in a magical school that somehow, some way his powers may like turn on at some point? Well, you know how recently we were talking about that late blooming person. It was said that by the time She was writing book three. J.K. Rowling said she changed her mind. But in book two, there's that whole quick spell. Yep. That whole subplot with Filch. So it's reasonable now that I'm reminded of that, that Filch was the guy that would have been the late bloomer. And if so, it could have come at a pivotal moment for later in the book. So maybe Filch is there. Can you imagine him with magical powers, though? That's not a good thing for the students. (laughs) Uh, Well, it could be maybe he like also gets a conscience. (laughs) He may may also get a little bit more respect. Well, respect and also like he'll hate students less if he can do something. Mm -hmm. That's the video game I want. 
Filch as the late blooming student. He's like 45, finally gets his magic, and he gets to really take out his frustrations on the students. Oh, man. So many chains. He'd just be shouting incarcerous at everybody, and they'd be like, <laughs> yeah. ah. Well, speaking of squibs, uh, we heard from Havana who asks, I believe squibs can talk to cats because Filch has a strange connection with Mrs. Norris. And in the fifth Harry Potter book, Mrs. Fig says, quote, but luckily I'd stationed Mr. Tibbles under a car just in case. And Mr. Tibbles came and warned me. This suggests that her cat, Mr. Tibbles, told her something. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't necessarily speak to cats, but I can tell you how clearly my cat tells me that she's hungry. <laughs> um, every morning at like 5.45 a.m. So there's definitely some, I guess, a spectrum there of how you can communicate. But it is important to note that Arabella Fig has measles, not cats. Measles are, they look like cats, but they're more of like a wizarding familiar. They're smarter, more intelligent, so you can put them on missions. Um, and I'm not sure if Mrs. Norris is a measle or not, because I think Crookshanks and Mrs. Norris, there was a question about that. Yeah. I believe Mrs. Norris is just a cat. It is interesting, okay. though, because I feel like, especially in the early books, there is such an emphasis placed on the relationship between Filch and Mrs. Norris. And there's also a great um, level of detail that goes into describing Mrs. Norris's lamp-like eyes and how Harry felt like she could see him under the invisibility cloak. Ooh. So I wonder if that was intended to set something up for what Eric was talking mm. about earlier. And then the author decided to drop that particular avenue of pursuit. But it is interesting. Uh, this was cons uh, confirmed on the website, by the way, on the author's website. Mrs. Norris is just a highly unpleasant cat. But Crookshanks, <laughs> I forgot, Rowling said on her Twitter that uh, Mrs. Norris would lose a fight with Crookshanks. Because Crookshanks has Neasel ancestry that would eventually give him the edge. So Crookshanks is part Neasel. Cats just have that natural tie to the magical world, right? When Generally, I, I feel like if you were to ask your average person, witches and cats just kind of have that synergistic relationship. And so I think that there is something to be said, though, for the fact that Filch needs Mrs. Norris in order for him to effectively do his job. Without her, mm, yeah. I don't think he would be as good. And so she is kind of his tie to being able to be an effective disciplinarian. Here's an email from Simon, longtime listener, approximately episode 50, first time contact. Not to make this a Marvel question, but if you see the villain in Thor Love and Thunder, is that not Voldemort in his new guise slash character now? It appears that Voldemort is continuing in a new realm outside of the Wizarding World. Who knew? Cheers. So, yes. Laura, I, I know you saw this movie. I don't know if anybody else did. I actually I haven't. I haven't seen the movie yet because oh, I uh, messed up my foot a few weeks ago. I'm not sure if I talked about this on the show. And uh, my mobility is limited. So going into a dark movie theater right now is not uh, going to be <laughs> it for me. But I know what Simon is talking about. I've seen this character design. And I agree. <laughs> It does look similar. Yes, very similar. Played by Christian Bale, by the way. Oh, I, I just Googled it. It's This is very Voldemort. Yes. Yep. Yeah, he still has a nose, but it's the, it's the skin tone, the bald head, the look, the eyes. It's, it's giving Voldemort, for sure. Yeah, it's like Voldemort crossed with Fester Adams. So very good call out there. Here's a good question from Peyton. I've been listening to all your stuff and love it. What would happen if a Jedi from Star Wars came to the world of Harry Potter? Would they get along as both magic people or would they fight? And who is more powerful? Well, if the Jedi is meeting Harry Potter, I would think they would get along because they're both forces for good. Who would be more powerful? A spell you can throw from across the room. A lightsaber. I mean, you'd have to throw the lightsaber. Well, they've got the force, too, and you can do that from a distance. That's tough. I think the force would still win. Now, a wand versus a lightsaber, the wand would win. But the force versus the wand, the force would win. Simply because of distance, you need to be away from one another. 
right? You know, well, it's interesting. I think too that in both cases they're very similar because uh, the more you study them, the better you are at them. If I, we were to talk about like the educational system of Jedi training versus Hogwarts, it's a wash uh, because all the best wizards did more than just go to school for it. All the best Jedi were like those private researchers that go into old caves and dig up old holograms. But yeah, I, th- I think your uh, reasoning is sound there, Andrew. I'm happy you say that because I am an extremely casual Star Wars fan. And like 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to say all that, even though what I said was pretty simple. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, if a Jedi throws his lightsaber at you from across the room to get to you, you can always arrest a momentum that it'll just stop. So I think I think a wand long distance is 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 pretty good guess. Now, a wizard against a stormtrooper wizard. All day, every day. Those stormtroopers are the most useless things I've ever seen. They always lose. They always get shot. (laughs) I don't know what point they serve in Star Wars. (laughs) It's exactly that. You need a threat without it being a very serious threat. You need the (laughs) sense. You need the sense of danger and adventure without really being in danger. They never win. They never win. Star Wars fans, I don't want the emails about it. If if a stormtrooper won one time. I I will (laughs) call this out. There is a Mythbusters episode where they recreate Stormtrooper blasts to see if you can outrun, uh, and they base it strictly on the the frame rate of the original Star Wars movies and recreate like a a bolt to see if uh, being bad at missing is plausible. And go check that out. Could a lightsaber parry Avada Kedavra, though? That can parry Force Lightning. Yeah, not sure. I don't know. Good question. I know the word parry comes up a lot in this script book. That's all I can say. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, our next email comes from Verity, who's writing in about a Harry Potter TV show idea. They say, after listening to episode 566, I wanted to pitch my own TV show idea. Maybe it's my age now, but after growing up with Harry Potter and as a massive fan, I am happy picking holes and laughing at some of the more ridiculous parts of the story us too. <laughs> I would love to see that side replicated in a mockumentary style TV show with the staff at Hogwarts through the years. Think The Office slash In the Shadows at Hogwarts. Interviews with the staff moaning about the nightmares the trio get into, complaining about the lack of security and laughing about the person who is stupid enough to take on the Defense Against the Dark Arts job. I could see a regular cameo from Peeves in every episode getting up to mischief, as well as seeing well-known events from another point of view with a humorous outlook. I think it would be popular with adults who fell in love with Harry Potter as a child, but have since grown and want to see something more appropriate for their age group love the podcast been listening for a good few years now keep it up i like this i think it'd be fun that would be fun i want it to be just like the office though i need the idiot boss the michael scott character (laughs) who would be that idiot boss do you think it'd be dumbledore Dumbledore. (laughs) yeah it would just he's he's so aloof sometimes i think that that is how they would characterize him in a show like this and gets yeah. everybody else to do his work actually mm-hmm. if you think about it too it's basically like the hogwarts real life staff room after like the end of book one where it's like the our dada teacher had another head on the back of his head i just had lunch with that guy on tuesday <laughs> <laughs> like yeah that kind of a thing yeah this would be fun for sure i would love to see something like this maybe one day mm. All right. Our next email comes from Taya, who has an alternative view of Percy. She says, hey, MuggleCast, avid listener here. I listened to your episode about indefensible characters and your take on Percy Weasley. He made a lot of mistakes through the books and let his pride take the best of him. But I wanted to offer an alternative reading of Percy's letter to Ron. If you read between the lines, I feel that the letter is way more than just him being a prick. As a matter of fact, I think it's just as plausible that he, in part, wants to hide his true feelings because of his pride and, in part, is afraid that the letter will be found or seen by anyone. Spies are everywhere, so he might not feel able to express himself freely. Here's my take. In the part about Harry and how Ron should stay away from him, I see this as an expression of care for Ron. He is genuinely worried about him being too close to Harry which can point to the fact that he knows that the ministry is somewhat corrupted in who they favor. 
He knows that being close to Harry may put his brother in harm's way. Again, he cares for Ron and feels protective towards him. We see that he encourages Ron and protects him plenty of times in the books, like in the third task of Goblet of Fire. I also think the letter is a way for Percy to warn his family, like the message he wants Ron to give to his mother. Even though the message he wants Ron to give her is, on surface level, a form of criticism, I think he is again showing that he's concerned for him. Someone close to his family is taken to Azkaban, which of course is terrifying. If we look past the way he's writing this part of the letter, we can see what he's really looking for is for Ron to warn Molly. He's seeing the ministry being critical to Dumbledore, making changes at Hogwarts, sending people to Azkaban, and being critical towards Harry. He's obviously worried that his family is at risk in this situation and feels helpless in trying to help them because of his position at the ministry. This part also makes me ache for him as I read this part as him missing his mother. I would think that he deep down would love to write to her. They were so close, and the first time he's away from his family, the whole wizarding society is in chaos. He's hoping to indirectly reach her through Ron and that she will understand that he's thinking about her. I always felt that the distance from his family was secretly painful for him. Could there be some nuances here? Love from Taya, a.k.a. Chris Rankin. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> this is an amazing defense of percy weasley yeah okay my opinion has been swayed for sure mm. i think it's a very good point that he could be trying to protect ron because of harry's vulnerabilities yeah i mean i would say he's definitely feeling some the absence of his mother and his family because he inevitably or eventually does turn around and come around and join them again. So th- there couldn't be none of that there for him to eventually go back to to their side and decide to fight in the battle. So I think, yeah, he's definitely a complex character. Okay, we got one more email today. It's going to bring us back to Fantastic Beasts, a really good email about Credence. But first, let's hear from our final sponsor this week, Me Undies. This isn't the first time we've told you about Me Undies. In fact, they've taken over the podcasting world. Famous for their buttery soft undies and bralettes, Me Undies loves podcasts just as much as you do. It's like you're made for each other. Me Undies are so much more than undies, though. Everyone knows Me Undies for their super soft undies and comfy bralettes, but did you know they make other stuff too? We're talking durable, cushy socks that will make your feet sing. We're also talking super stretchy loungewear. We're talking daily tees, shorts, and rompers that add a little silky softness to your everyday. They even make hoodies for your dog so you can match every important person or animal in your life. Available in sizes extra small through 4XL and tons of colors and prints make MeUndies your destination for all things soft and sustainable. Whatever you try on from Me Undies for the first time, you'll ask yourself where they've been all your life and why you haven't tried them sooner. Truly, they're so unique and comfortable. You combine this with comfort from their really, really fun designs, and you just have really awesome clothing both inside and out. Me Undies has a great offer for our listeners. For any first time purchasers, you get 20% off plus free shipping and returns. To get 20% off your first order, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash MuggleCast. That's MeUndies.com slash MuggleCast. We have links to all of today's sponsors in the show notes. Okay, and uh, wrapping up our emails today, here comes one from Crystal, uh, who asks why the Dumbledores didn't know about Credence. Hey all, I'm late to the game because I wasn't able to watch the new movie until it came out on HBO Max, so I've been binging all the episodes you have been put uh you have put out since. Thanks, Crystal. You all have mentioned having issues about the Dumbledore brothers not knowing about Credence or trying to find him. This is my take on it. Aberforth had a baby with a woman. A child outside of wedlock was widely unacceptable in that time period in the Muggle world, and you would assume it was also the case in the Wizarding world. Maybe Aberforth didn't stop his baby mama's parents from sending her and the baby away. Thus, he was asking forgiveness from Credence for that in the one scene we see. The baby mama thought her child had drowned, so even if she had contacted uh, Aberforth after the ship went down, assuming she survived, Aberforth and Albus would have all assumed the child had died as well. There's no reason either brother would have thought they needed to go searching for Aberforth's son, even if he wanted to. Any rumors that Albus may have heard were probably never addressed. He was likely estranged from his brother during that time because of everything that went down with Ariana. If they thought that the child had died, why bring up something so painful to Aberforth when they began speaking again? 
Only since the big reveal in Crimes of Grindelwald, which Lita's story surely got told to Albus and maybe Alberforth somehow overheard, did Albus and Alberforth think to look at the manifest of passengers on that fateful voyage and see the baby mama's name and possibly the only other infant on the ship listed and realize Credence was their nephew slash son. Thanks. A lot of work there, Crystal. Uh, I think it's plausible. This is great. Yeah. Print this and put it in the script book because I think this adds <laughs> some much needed context to some of the things that we saw in this movie. Yeah. Like, how does why does Al- Albus tell Credence, we didn't know, I promise. Yeah. So. We didn't know you were still alive. Yeah. I promise. I yeah. think that's what Crystal is saying here. Mm, I see. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I buy this. I think... They completely pushed aside the whole baby swap thing in the third movie, obviously. I think they were desperate to clean things up and simplify it. And one of the victims of trying to simplify is you don't get the context you needed when Aberforth is and, and Albus is saying, you know, we never knew. I'm, I'm, we had no idea. That could have been a great opportunity to talk about the boat and why they had no idea that Credence was still alive. But got to simplify. Thank you, Crystal. Okay, well, thanks to everybody who writes into the show. We really love seeing all your emails and your feedback and the additional context that you provide to our discussions. It's all so amazing. If you have any feedback about today's discussion or anything we ever discuss, you can send an owl to mugglecast at gmail.com, or you can use the contact form on mugglecast.com. You can also send a voice message. You can record it using the voice memo app on your phone, and then you can email us that file, or you can use our phone number. It's one nine two zero three muggle That's one nine two zero three six eight four four five three. Next week on MuggleCast, it's our birthday party. We're turning 17. If you want to attend, we are hosting the MuggleCast trivia game, Quizage Live. It is occurring this Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern. Be ready to watch the stream and play on a virtual gamepad that you can play on your phone or another tab on your uh, web browser. We do recommend a computer, though, for the best experience, just because you can have multiple windows open at the same time easily. So again, that's this Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern. It will be a MuggleCast trivia game, a MuggleCast edition of Quizage Live. And we actually will have an announcement about our plans for MuggleCast in the months and years ahead on this episode. We thought our birthday would be a good time to share what our plans are coming up. Speaking of Quizzage, it's time for the weekly installment of Quizzage. Woohoo! Last week's question from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. What resident of Little Hangleton is quoted as saying Frank Bryce definitely killed the riddles, no matter what the police think? The correct answer was Dot. Dot in the Hangman pub. And congratulations to those who submitted the correct answer, including Natasha, Max, a.k.a. Prongs, Pota, should be kinder to Dumbledore. Oh, you should be kinder to Dumbledore. Andrew. Laura for President 2024, Lupin's Lady 93, Buff Daddy, Boobatuber Puss, Andrew, again, and a slightly shy Welsh green nibbling at a grass as a palate cleanser after the mice. And it's time for next week's question. Who succeeded Albus Dumbledore as Supreme Mugwump of the International Confederation of Wizards? Vindicated! (laughs) <laughs> okay, everybody, this is a hard one because it's not in any book. This is from extended canon, but who becomes the Mugwump after Albus Dumbledore? You have two weeks to enter. Seeing as how next week is our Quizich Live, we will have multiple questions other than this. So we'll come back to you on episode 574. Uh, so you have two weeks to enter this. You do so via the MuggleCast website, mugglecast.com slash Quizich, or go to the website and click on Quizich in the nav bar. Don't forget, just about two weeks left to become a patron at patreon.com slash MuggleCast to become eligible for either the MuggleCast Wands or the MuggleCast Collectors Club to really great gifts. Again, patreon.com slash MuggleCast. Not only do you get those physical gifts, you get bonus MuggleCast installments once a month. We're going to be cooking up a spicy edition of bonus MuggleCast soon. We're going to share all the tea related to the show. 
Um, so that'll be fun in the weeks ahead. We also have live streams. You can hop into our recording studio every Saturday morning. You get a personalized video thank you message, all kinds of benefits. So check them out. Your support goes to running the show. So thank you very much. Also, don't forget to follow the show for free in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode and leave us a review if they allow you to. And don't forget to follow us on social media. We are MuggleCast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And we got that Instagram Live coming up this week, August 3rd at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be talking about our favorite MuggleCast memories from over the years. For our birthday! Thanks again, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. I'm off to eat some crust of bread. Goodbye, everybody. I'll toss them to you, Andrew. You can swoop in. <laughs> <laughs>